and welcome to the July 31st edition of the Freedom Hub Working Group webinar uh, series. We do uh, have great guests every week, and today is no exception. Right there, if you're looking on my screen, there is the uh, website to register for each week's event, bit.ly, Freedom Hub Working Group, all caps. Share that around to bring more freedom-loving activists into our weekly gathering. Uh, this event could not happen without the sponsorship of the health company that a few of us are involved. We are the libertarian Uber for the cartel. Yourfreedomhub.com is our new marketing site for what we're up to. Uh, healthcare is just a part of what we're doing. It is the main part. So we're pro promoting the healthy care strategy. We make, we make cash pairs and patients in part with cash shop around and disclose prices. So that is the key to freeing the market from the cartel. Uh, so uh, get with me or Joe on the call if you want to join our, our takeover of the healthcare to let you make your own choices. And a lot of doctors uh, love what we're doing. And uh, so that uh, is who is sponsoring us. And we're excited today to have um, Adrian Moore uh, from the Reason Foundation um, so talking about the problems of marijuana legalization, which is inevitable. I mean, despite 100 years of prohibition, no one with any sense can find any merit uh, into, you know, destroying uh, humanity with, with prohibition. There's, there's absolutely nothing good about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, people are afraid and easily brainwashed. And so, you know, they, they think it's all a bunch of druggies and, and they, they blame the drugs for the cartels and, and all that. Uh, but we have huge new markets now, legal market with the cannabis plant. And so we are going to um, discuss that with Adrian Moore. Uh, quick preview of coming guests. Um, next week, we have the immigration debate, and that is going to be with Charles Cook, a well-known um, lawyer in the immigration field, and Alex uh, Noriste from the Cato Institute. Uh, another fairly demagogued issue, so come come to our fireworks next week for that one. Uh, not shying away from controversies, in two weeks we are going to dip our toe in the uh, terribly heated water of informed consent and whether you can mandate medicines uh, in a market that is supposedly governed by the sacred ethic of informed consent. And we will have two doctors, Jim Meehan and Brian Hooker, uh, the latter uh, well known in informed consent circles for cajoling uh, CDC uh, measles vaccine researcher William Tom Thompson to blow the whistle uh, on the, the, the fraud in his study that is used so much, the discounted connection to autism. And in three weeks, uh, we will have Mr. Libertarian, Professor Walter Block, uh, continue his defense of Trump. Uh, and he's a fair cop, so he'll show where he falls down on the job. And uh, he'll also talk about his classic book, Defending the uh, Undefendable. And finally, a month from now, uh, we have another former Cato colleague of mine, Michael Tanner, to talk about the universal basic income, not as a great idea in, a, in and of itself, but as a replacement for welfare. Similar to that talk we had a few months ago, with Dave Beto on returning to mutual aid, which helped uh, the poor and working class before being displaced by welfare. So that's our preview. And as uh, I, I hand the reins over to you, uh, Adrian, um, let me just say that you're, you have a PhD, you're the vice president of policy at the, the Reason Foundation and you've uh, been published in the Wall Street Journal. You have a book out that you can remind us what the, what the name is in a second. And uh, let me just make you the presenter there, Adrian. And here comes the window for you to accept. So, 
one thing I want to do, so a little bit more self-introduction. Uh, uh, as is already mentioned, I'm, I'm VP at Reason, and we've been working for a few years now on the question of as states legalize marijuana, what, how do they, how do they create these markets, uh, and if you know, how do they deal with the fact that they're not actually creating a market? How do they re try to regulate these markets and all the challenges that come with that? And it's been quite an eye opener for me. Uh, so that's partly what I want to share with you guys is a little bit of what I've learned uh, from that process. I do want to give you an apology up front. Uh, I recently started a new blood pressure medication, which has the very bizarre side side effect of making me cough. And so at any random interval, I can suddenly have a cough, which I am doing my best to suppress. But if I cough, I apologize in advance. Um, so one great thing that I've learned from looking at how states have tried to regulate these legalized marijuana markets is how much wider the gap is between the average policymaker and any even fundamental basic, you know, grade school level understanding of markets. Uh, it's so much worse than I think any libertarian, however cynical, has actually thought it is. I thought I was really cynical about how uneducated the average legislator is on markets, let alone the average bureaucrat. And I'm constantly just gobsmacked at how much more ignorant they are than I realized. Um, so, you know, if you're not cynical enough, this is a great area to get into to really reinforce your cynicism. Um, it seems like it's pretty straightforward, right? You know, this is something people have been buying and selling for a long time. So to make it legal to do so should be, you know, politically, it's a big jump. But uh, in terms of markets, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a jump. Um, you know, you would hope that a legalized market would have rules and taxes similar to comparable product markets, that this legalized market eliminate the black market because why would anybody buy in the black? I mean, black markets only exist when the legal market is overly restricted, right? I mean, that's kind of a fundamental reality. Um, you, would, you would hope that this market has you know entry and exit you know we all know good functioning markets allow new 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 providers to come in and providers to go out of business if they don't provide a good product or don't satisfy their customers um because we are talking about marijuana or cannabis products i should say uh it's has some resemblance to alcohol in that we've got a long ways to go uh, I think before, as a society, we're ready to accept uh, that that you know juveniles can have access to this. So basically, one of the fundamentals is it's still going to be illegal for juveniles to have access to this product in the same way that's true for alcohol and tobacco. Um, and uh, we haven't we haven't we haven't won on that one yet, even in places where we've legalized, uh, or we haven't convinced people that there's better ways to do that than uh, prohibition. Um, and that there remains some real externalities or, you know, potential market problems. The biggest one being, uh, impaired driving. Um, you know, impaired driving is a real, is an actual problem with marijuana. And, uh, we just as, as long as the roads are government owned and frankly, you know, gone through the whole thought experiment, if we privatize the roads, uh, the private companies in order to manage their liability and provide a safe product for the consumers would also not allow Im impaired driving and would also enforce against impaired driving. So not allowing impaired driving until we have automated vehicles and then we won't have to worry about that anymore. But for the time being, we do. Uh, and then, you know, I think a big part of, of a positive approach to this is trying to replace all the prohibitionist restrictions on, you know, that are justified to marijuana use with 
uh, you know, cultural and social norms. In other words, to the extent society thinks people should moderate their public uh, behavior while high, uh, that should come about primarily through, you know, social pressures and not by making it an arrestable offense the way it often is uh, under prohibition. Um, essentially, they're not getting any of those things right. Um, you know, the, the real uh, killer statistics are that in all of the states that have legalized recreational marijuana, the black markets are still thriving, not just continuing to exist, but thriving. Uh, because without exception, all of the states that have legalized are overtaxing and overregulating these markets. And uh, so, you know, you have all kinds of complications that, that that brings into the picture. And I think ultimately, to get to what we should have, which are free markets for legalized marijuana, uh, there's a lot of learning that has to be done by legislators and legislatures. And I think a lot of, of the populace who are too ready to say, marijuana, it's a little bit scary, it's a little bit different. We can't just regulate it like we do, you know, groceries and dry cleaners. We've got to, you know, it's got to be more regulated than that, right? Isn't that just common sense? And so, and so they accept overregulation and overtaxation uh, to such an extent that you still have a big black market. Um, and, and so we're not resolving many of the problems of prohibition because so much of that's driven by the black market, the, you know, unsafe product in the market, uh, the, the lack of recourse to the law that you have uh, with a legal market. Um, and as long as the federal government still has an accepted legalization, the the remaining existence of black markets is constantly used by federal law enforcement and others as a justification for remaining uh, uptight <laughs> uh, about this and and continuing lots of enforcement actions even in legalized markets. So there's it's just, it's kind of a mess is is the bottom line. Uh, the upside is, of course, that in legalized states, people who've wanted access to cannabis products now have much, much better access. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag at best. It also turns out to be a more complicated process to actually get a legalized market in place. Um, I think the, whether it, you know, Outside of Illinois, as you probably all know, it's all been done by ballot initiative up to this point. Illinois taking the first step to do it legislatively. We'll probably see more of that as well as potentially more ballot measures. Um, but generally, that's only phase one. There's usually a legalization bill or initiative. Then there's an implementation bill. Sometimes those can be combined. I think Illinois essentially combined them, though it's pretty obvious there's going to be follow-on legislation by the legislature. So you've got these at least a couple of waves of legislation that set a lot of the initial uh, uh, rules. And then you have a rulemaking process where the regulatory agency was actually, you know, governing this market in 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 its conception by the legislature. Uh, goes through a whole rulemaking process. And then in some places like Colorado, you see a lot of adjustment and revision. Colorado has been interesting because they've kind of steadily liberalized their market uh, because they've realized more than any other state that the overregulation is a problem. They've still got a long ways to go, but compared to say Washington, which has refused to basically to change much of any of its rules, even though they're clearly not working, uh, at least Colorado is, is trying. Um, looking at all these places and, and working with uh, legislators in several states and regulator, regulatory agencies in several states, uh, you know, Michigan is in the process of writing the rules right now. They just released three, four weeks ago their uh, emergency regulations, which were just quick regulations they put together so that the market started before their actual deadline provided by legislation to to have final rules in place uh, by November, um, which is good. You know, they could have drugged this out all the way to November and been perfectly legal, but they wanted to try to get things moving. 
Uh, they're definitely taking a more li liberal approach than any uh, uh, state so far. And, and I think great, uh, you know, a great, hopefully a great step forward. Uh, it's still a long ways from a, from a free market. Um, just to hit a few principles that we've sort of identified as areas where there's kind of repeated problems and a need to sort of make a change in in the rules that are being imposed on these markets. Um, first is the tax burden. So uh, basically everybody's looking at it as a fiscal windfall. Um, again, that that re that remaining sort of cultural, you know, fairly broad, even among people who support legalization, uh, there's a lot of support for the idea that this is still a special uh, a substance that needs a lot more oversight and scrutiny, aka regulation, than other products. Um, opens a lot of doors for uh, um, uh, justifying higher taxes and uh, also the political deal to get legalization passed generally includes throwing a lot of money at a lot of different programs. Uh, and so you gotta have the taxes to do that. So high tax rates are driving a lot of ongoing black market activity. You know, in some states you have 30, 40% differentials. Uh, actually in some states you have 100% differentials between legal and black market uh, prices for a given you know, product. And uh, so, you know, in those conditions, the black market uh, continues to continues to thrive. Um, so, setting taxes at for starters, uh, you know, setting taxes with other basic consumer products. I mean, it's not obvious that cannabis should be taxed any different from any other product that's sold in Walgreens, uh, for example. Um, so, get it. It's, you know, it won't be market distortionary, at least at that level. And then we can have the fight about overall tax levels uh, instead of this always being a special case. Um, every state, every state that has looked at this and is looking at it is consumed with the idea that you can define, and this is like the most classic Hayekian uh, uh, fallacy, uh, that they can define the right size of the market that they know how much marijuana needs to be produced how much cannabis products needs to be produced uh how many growers need to be licensed how many uh, uh wholesalers need to be licensed how many retailers need to be licensed and of course they're completely wrong across the board about that they have no clue there's no methodology for calculating that it's complete you know planners uh, hubris um and yet uh so far, it's been really, really hard to get any of them to let go of that idea uh, and accept that a license, if they're going to license folks, it should be like, you know, uh, most other businesses licenses. Again, just trying to normalize this product so that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're showing basic ability to operate the business in compliance with the law and paying a modest fee and you can get a license and however many people want a license get the license and you let the market sort out how many are going to be and how many are going to fail nobody's doing that yet it's possible that michigan will there's kind of two camps there on whether they should have a completely open license process or put some limits on it i'm hopeful that the open side will win out and, and we'll get our first ability to sort of show that it works uh, in Michigan, we will see. But uh, needless to say, in every state that does restrict the number of licenses, you have a restricted market that's not going to uh, be as successful as a free market and that also fuels continued black markets. Uh, <laughs> social justice is a huge issue in this which is helpful in some ways because one of the things that you want to see with legalization is is a broad category of of expungement activity in other words people should no longer face legal 
uh, black marks or continued punishment for doing something that is now legal. Um, and, and that's largely driven by social justice concerns. But at the same time, social justice concerns are used to say all kinds of crazy stuff like we should give, you know, we should take a set percentage of these licenses and give them to selected people who we as the elites judge were somehow more screwed over than average by the prohibition regime. And uh, so they, they now need some compensation of being given part of this market. And you get in these conversations, literally, that's how they think about it. We, we have this market and we can dole it out and, uh, and we can decide who's going to be in. And it, it, <laughs> it's, uh, it's can be so Soviet sometimes. It's just astonishing. Uh, so letting go of, of, of that and, and allowing entry and exit into the market be driven by, you know, basic business acumen, competency and market outcomes, uh, is, is a necessary step to having a successful cannabis market. Um, most states have restricted vertical and horizontal integration, uh, you know, like we shouldn't be surprised by some of this stuff. And I should have said this up top that to me, one of the fundamental drivers of all this is the fact that the progressive left has essentially run on politically anyway, on legalizing marijuana for a long time. I mean, it's always been a core libertarian issue, but libertarians don't have a lot of legislators in the state legislature and uh, the major uh, legalization advocacy groups have primarily worked with the left uh, on this. And so they're increase, increasingly over the years staffed by people who, along with being pro-legalization, are also extremely uh, uh, aggressive in their views, which means they don't believe in capitalism at all. They don't believe in markets at all. And so the same people that have are, are considered by most legislators to be the most prominent voices on legalization uh, are folks saying, you know, um, you don't want big companies in this business. It should all be mom and pops. Let's not allow vertical integration because uh, then, you know, uh, we all know vertical integration is evil. We don't want inter we don't want national companies. We want only companies that are local to the state. Uh, uh, legislation that has literally limited the income and the wealth of people. Uh, allowed to invest in or own businesses. Um, it, on and on this goes. This, these, these crazy ideas about, again, determining who can and can't be in the market and not allowing sort of market outcomes in terms of vertical and horizontal integration, again, means you're going to be have inefficient markets uh, that uh, foster continued black markets. Another big issue is local governments. So most states are allowing local governments to opt out of, well, let me rephrase that. Most states are allowing local governments to ban uh, cannabis businesses within their jurisdiction if they choose. Uh, and this is you know, largely a political deal in order to avoid having all the cities fight the legalization. This is a way to take them out of the fight. Uh, you know, from a legislative uh, perspective, and but the consequence of that is 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 kind of wacky in California, where sixty some percent of the population voted in favor of legalization. Uh, four fifths of communities have banned uh, cannabis businesses within their jurisdiction. So the the <laughs> those those local governments are not representing the majority of their population. They're, they're representing, they're making those decisions based on special interest pleading. Uh, and, uh, and that's creating a huge dysfunction in the California market. Um, and you have the same thing on a somewhat lower scale in Colorado, where so much, so many of consumers are essentially uh, blocked out of the market or have to go to great lengths in order to participate in the market. Uh, and and delivery businesses aren't really very successful so far at, at filling that gap. Um, and again, 
this this leads to dysfunction, high prices, uh, yeah, you know, unnecessary restrictions, and continued reliance uh, upon the black market. And I guess the the last thing that is missing from all of these states is one basing restrictions on you know evidence of an actual problem uh you know they either imagine a problem and say well let's put a rule in place to prevent this imaginary problem never mind it might never actually emerge in the market uh or they fancy they can control something that they can't really control um one way or another they're 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 restricting things based on uh hypotheticals without any real evidence that there's either a problem to be solved or that their solution would actually solve it if the problem did occur. And there's no built-in easy mechanism for adjusting these, uh, you know, as reality comes home to roost. Colorado's, you know, taken advantage of the flexibility. The legislature's pretty much passed uh, additional bills every year since they legalized refining and, and like I said before, mostly somewhat loosening things up, opening things up here and there. The regulators are, you know, progressively each time they revise the rules, generally loosening things up. Um, so it's slow progress. Uh, um, that's really kind of the the main highlights I want to hit. There's there's sort of an infinite level, near infinite level of detail on this stuff, but. I wanted to leave, um, I only want to use about half the time going over things and leave the rest for questions and discussion with you guys. Um, you know, it's an interesting space for, I think, for libertarians, uh, both in terms of our views of drug policy and overcoming prohibition, but also for our under of the battle we're still fighting over the disconnect in our society between capitalism, free markets, and, uh, you know, regulation and, and state control. Um, you know, this is really like the front lines of that these days in a, in a very interesting show. Happy to take questions. Thanks, Adrian. And I'll start with a, a comment uh, in the uh, question area of the control panel that probably anyone can see, I think, but, but if not, I'll read it. Uh, someone who participated in today's webinar but left didn't leave until leaving this question, which is a comment. They wrote, a pothead is a pothead. End of, end of discussion. Sad need for a bust. Now, Adrian, I don't quite <laughs> get the last part of his statement, um, but I think I know yeah. who it is, who is a, you know, a popular, successful old healthcare wizard. Uh, but I guess he's from the older generation that has little sympathy for the um, modernization of drug policy. Yeah. I think, you know, we all can agree. It's a tough for some folks to buy, isn't it? Yeah, and it it remains the most interesting discussions I think I have with legislators on this stuff is with Republican legislators who are to some extent still really not comfortable with legalization, but have become so disenchanted with the war on drugs. Uh, and I use disenchanted, that's a real soft word actually for how they usually feel. Um, but they've just become convinced that prohibition in the war on drugs is a colossal failure, or at least has costs that vastly exceed the benefits. And so uh, we should look at alternatives. And so a lot of those conversations then wind up being about, well, look, if we legalize, there's, gonna, there's lots of people like you who don't think using marijuana is a good idea. Um, you know, you're free to, in a free society, to make your case and to stand up in your church or in your community or in your school and say, here is the reason you shouldn't use marijuana and why it's bad for you. Um, that's the mechanism by which we should try to prevent, uh, you know, drug abuse and problems uh, with drug use, not uh, prohibition, because prohibition 
A, doesn't work for that, and B, creates all these other horrible problems, and C, you know, just fundamentally assaults people's rights. So uh, that's really, I think, coming home to roost. So some people are just so morally repulsed by uh, drug use um, that, you know, they, they can't get past that. And, I, you know, there's not much you can do about that. It always puzzles me why, uh, why marijuana use is any worse than alcohol use, because by every objective mer mer um, you know, in terms of social impacts, health impacts, you name it, alcohol is much worse. And yet we don't, you know, we don't have a war on alcohol and we don't ban alcohol. We've come to terms somewhat as a society with legal alcohol use. So it doesn't seem like that much of a stretch to do the same for cannabis. Thanks. And Joe, I'll, you know, let you chime in here too, but I do see a hand raised from Dave Demarest, if you want to unmute yourself. And while you do that, David, uh, Dr. Singleton, if maybe you can think of a question as a doctor, I mean, I know that your profession uh, goes back and forth on cannabis as medicine uh, and then, you know, people with problems handling it and that kind of thing. So I'd be interested in your take after. Go ahead, Dave, ask your question. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Adrian, this is David Demarest with uh, Roads to Freedom Foundation. I'm uh, 78 and part of the older generation, but uh, perhaps my question will be a bit more enlightened. So aside from the obvious ignorance of economics, human action, and decision-making on the part of government officials, and perhaps a major segment of the population, it seems to me that the crux of the problem is the challenge of moving from legal enforcement of prohibitions to economic and social ostracism and on the positive side reinforcement. A political solution seems unlikely due to government's vested interest in institutional power structures. How do we convince the public otherwise? How can we set an example? Now that is, uh, that's a great way to frame it. Um, I mean, it's to some extent, I would argue completely what is happening. The reason why states are legalizing is that the, the population has shifted. And you can see this in polls and things. You know, it wasn't that long ago that a minority of Americans supported legalizing. And, uh, when you look at especially like focus groups that have been able to dig in with people on why they changed their mind, um, what I see is is there's a number of factors that come out in these things in, in lots of different surveys and, and focus groups. But the two that stand out often, I think, are one, the rise of 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 um, of credible medical uses and um, the, the realization that, well, that changes the balance of, of sort of costs and benefits in a fundamental way. The other is the realization that someone or some several people that they know who are successful, responsible people are users of cannabis <laughs> and and realizing that not everybody who uses cannabis is a home with you know pothead and that a succession of experiences like that across hundreds of thousands of people has caused this huge shift in the population so to some extent it's already going on and i think reinforcing it is is part of of our role i i often say uh, when I'm speaking on this, so I might as well do it on it now, is is I think two crucial realizations need to happen with a lot more people. Uh, the, the people who are against, uh, who oppose drug use, um, or who even those who support the war on drugs, uh, have got to recognize that there's far more responsible use of drugs than they realize. And libertarians and other advocates for you know laissez-faire approaches on drugs need to recognize that there are far more 
drug abusers and far more problems created by drug use than they usually recognize. And and so we have to, you know, we have to unwind the the I think broad agreement on unwinding prohibition and 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 the failed war on drugs uh, is growing. But in that place is going to have to come some of of um, voluntary collective action around uh, helping to manage uh, those issues and helping educate and uh, support folks in, you know, not falling into uh, 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 drug use that does create external effects, uh, either, you know, on their children or on, on people that are not within their own family out there at large, you know, everything from impaired driving uh, on down. So, um, it does require a, a big shift, like you say. Um, thinking of the medical things, I was very disappointed. I guess it just came out a couple of days ago that new testing centers weren't allowed because I think that's one of the biggest keys to even trying to advance anything with uh, decriminalization or legalization, whichever path you take, of marijuana, because there's a lot of testing that still needs to be done. I mean, more and more things are coming out now it's, that it's legal, this marijuana psychosis, the right. damage it does to teens' brains, the, the vomiting and nausea of marijuana use, and it's coming out now because people used to come to the ER with these issues but they would not admit that they had taken marijuana. So of course there's no way to make that diagnosis. Now they're telling the truth. And, um, and so we really need more testing centers and I, I just don't get the DEA's justification <laughs> for not doing that. And yeah. because we have to be able to have an intoxication test. I think liability issues will become paramount i mean you make somebody a quadriplegic because you're driving intoxicated and you know what's ins your insurance company going to do and um you know certainly if you're drunk driving you can apply the liability but what do you do with pot because the tests are too non-specific as they stand now right yeah in you know just on that last item, yeah, you're you you have uh, the insurance companies have a problem unless they have a a finding of impairment, which they can, at this point they can only get if there's a, a drug recognition expert evaluation done on the driver, uh, you know, which right in the case of an accident often is doesn't happen. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, that's that's a, a microcosm of the big you raise which is uh we're we're moving we're, we're doing a bottoms up laboratories to democracy approach on this thing and it's still illegal at the federal level which means universities can't do research it means i can't you know the reason why we know the blood alcohol level that is highly correlated with uh you know impairment is literally tens of thousands of people were put on driving simulators and given ever more alcohol and their blood alcohol was measured and their performance and driving was measured and correlations were mapped out and we were able to say oh okay you know based on a ton of data we have a pretty good idea of how this works you can't do that with cannabis right now right uh, so well, we you know we can measure thc in the blood but we know it's metabolized completely differently from alcohol and so that thc in your blood the relationship between thc in your blood and impairment has not been empirically established in the way right. blood alcohol and impairment has been. And until we can do those kind of experiments, you're not going to get that. Um, the tests are also, you know, uh, much more time sensitive with THC than they are with alcohol. So there's a lot of technical and medical difficulties. And we're just not going to resolve those or the bigger medical questions as long as the federal government is in the way. Uh, so getting the feds to reschedule or do something 
you know, is vastly important to making a lot of progress. And we've put out reports and commentary on what I call the need for common sense uh, by consumers. You know, lots of people are out there consuming cannabis products recreationally or medically based on Joe told me. <laughs> I mean, we don't know a lot about, you know, uh, effects of recreational use. Um, you know, it's been around long enough. Responsible recreational use is probably not a problem, but young people's brains is definitely, we have enough evidence that it has a much bigger effect on young people's brains. So juvenile use is much more of a problem than adult use and high concentration use appears to have very different effects from moderate concentration use. And so there's lots of stuff. Uh, well, and even people, people want to use, you know, even, even, uh, uh, taking the THC out of it and just CBD products, you know, people using this stuff, pregnant women using it for nausea, you know, because it does help with nausea, right? But if you're pregnant, we have literally nothing on how does CBD oil affect fetuses. We don't know. So you might want to use some common sense, right? <laughs> uh, right? But people, you know, people are used to government and not having to use their common sense. And here's an area where you know, no, you gotta, or you gotta revert to your uh, your individualist self and start using your own common sense. You can't, you know, rely on the government. It's going to be years before they do the research where, you know, there's there's proof on this stuff. Well, Hopkins, um, I recently went to a, a lecture, an alumni thing, and they're really trying to plug in all aspects of this. They even had a, a great study on uh, contact high, which they said <laughs> to the joys of um, college students who'd be able to tell their parents, it wasn't me, I didn't smoke right. the marijuana. Yeah, right. And I mean, they actually um, had rooms made to be like dorm rooms and stuffed towels under the door and you know everything <laughs> that people did in college. And right. indeed, just being in the next room, you could get a contact high. You know, they're actually measurable levels. So there's so much to learn, and uh, only three medical centers are right. doing the research, and, you know, we need 10 medical centers doing it. Yeah. Joe, do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the discussion has been, you know, largely around cannabis as in, you know, mind altering. Uh, and it's 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 the shame to me because the education that people actually need is understanding that a cannabis plant has over a hundred types of cannabinoids. THC is only one type of cannabinoid, and it's only in certain strains of cannabis. And I think when people realize that there's no psychoactive effects unless the THC cannabinoid has been heated, then I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just interesting because, you know, mother's milk contains cannabinoids. We have an, every animal has an endocannabinoid system. Um, like I, my whole position is total plant freedom, you know, the libertarian stance. And I understand, you know, we have, we have to, we have to, you know, kind of play the game, right? Do we choose to side with the people who are putting their money into the legalization of it so that, you know, it can, it can get legalized to the point that it is legalized right now? Or, I mean, if we create these regulations as we're creating them now, it's still something that's to be policed. We still have to right. worry about court systems going in and locking people up and doing all of these things. Then we have to get even more detailed down to, like, which strain is doing what. And it's like, nah, like, what would it take for a state to just say the hell with it? Total plant freedom, no government regulation no taxes, just let's see what the free market really does with this plant. Because it would open a state for business with, from medicinal to uh, all the industrial purposes of it. You know, so, you know, it could be the top producing paper state. It could be the top producing toilet paper state. It could be the top biofuel state. 
I mean, there's so many uses for this magnificent plant, and we always get caught up in this discussion about the psychoactive effects of one portion of the plant. And it's a yeah, well, superfood. It's a superfood. If yeah, everybody was right. eating the leaves and juicing the leaves, their health would be transformed. The animals that we eat, we eat would have cannabinoids in their meats again. It's just silly to me. It's just silly. Well, two two responses to that. One, I, I, I went, went sort of uh, – so first of all, uh, the, the cold hard fact is that most people consume it for the mind altering effects. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of the reality on the ground out there. I mean, you're right. There's a million other ways it could be used and that's probably going to grow steadily now that people have legal access to it. Cause not many people are going to go to the black market for a superfood. Um, well, but, I mean, how many people yeah. are going to go to the black market to be able to cr get the cement so that they can have hemp crete to build a home so that it breathes naturally. <laughs> Yeah, but that's what you I'm saying. What I mean? Most like, people are I mean, willing, willing to break the law to get access to that, but they have been willing to to get the recreational effects. So, you know, but I mean, the is, the, the reality of really, the of the market, the market is clearly expressing a preference for for the psychoactive effects. But you're right. That's all, that's primarily because in a black market, there's no mechanism for people to develop their taste for and consumption of all those that vast multiplicity of other uses so uh you know plant freedom would allow that the but that then to get to that second part of your question about what would it take for a state to allow plant freedom i mean i would say right now you've got somewhat less than five percent of the population would support play fair plant freedom you got to get that number up to 55 percent and then you might get a state that does that so it's this is all a social change problem, not a legislative change problem. Legislation is the last step of social change, not the first. But that, so, yeah, we just. But, that, and, but the legalization but, that's happening helps with that, I think. The the aspect the legalization absolutely helps with it. The whole discussion happening absolutely helps with it. The the weird the weird thing is is I mean you say that the the league the illegal version is like the one that's you know talked about and it's the biggest market so we have to pay attention to that and like you know from a standpoint of the me media bombarding us I would agree that that's true if we actually looked at the numbers of people consuming hemp seeds and hemp oil and uh, actually using it by going to the grocery store and looking at what those numbers are. I, I mean, I don't know if that's, if the illegal market is, you know, how, what, where's the difference in those markets? You know, the illegal one might be bigger because it's a, a black market thing. It's not regulated. People, most people, if I talk to them about hemp seeds, it's far often than not, they don't know about it unless they're, a, right. you know, a natural <laughs> health connoisseur. <laughs> you know, and then they, they definitely yeah. consume hemp oil and hemp seed. Well, the willingness of some states that are not yet politically ready to decriminalize, but to open up the the low THC hemp market, uh, you know, like we're seeing in, you know, North Carolina, Florida, right? Um, I think that's also a total game changer in terms of what you're talking about, because once there's an a legal tax paying industry <laughs> you know providing why does it gotta products, be why does it gotta be tax a, and, paid? and 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 they can put advertising out you know right and all the things that help grow a market i think then that fuels that change in people's consumption and preferences and you're right when the the getting high part of it becomes you know you could say the same thing for alcohol Total use of the chemical compound of alcohol is much vaster than the getting drunk use of alcohol, right? Um, and but people don't necessarily think about that, but it's still true. And so when you know when the use of 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 hemp plants is like that, and and the recreational mind altering stuff is a small part of that market, um, then the attitude about the whole plant, like you say, I think really starts to change.
Very good. Um, thanks. Uh, Dave, I see your hand is up still, or is that a holdover from the past? Do you have a, a last question for Adrian? Uh, yes, it's still up. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Uh, my observation is that the legal approach and the medical approach discussed so far is negative reinforcement. And going back to your comment on common sense, which I interpret to be economic and social reinforcement, there's both a negative and a positive side to that. And when you think about it, most of the free market and most of our personal lives are dominated by economic and social ostracism and reinforcement. So I suggest we take a harder look at the positive reinforcement side of the common sense that you talk about. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that's partly what I'm getting at when I say um, that, that part of what's changed people's minds about legalization is the realization that there's why that responsible use is much more widespread than they had previously realized and that continuing that realization is i think part of of the transformation we need to go through so you know i would put the answer to your question kind of in those terms of that uh i think the more people see and experience and practice responsible use uh the more that becomes what people see around them and uh, the parallels i think to alcohol are pretty obvious right like most people understand that most people consume alcohol in a way that if not perfectly responsible is uh, not irresponsible and not harmful to anyone except maybe on occasion themselves and that really you with the problems of drunk drivers and you know these kind of instances where people create you know social external harms uh through their alcohol abuse um which everybody recognizes a limited case and doesn't represent the broad use of alcohol in society getting to that kind of place with with cannabis i think you get to that through various forms of of positive approaches, like you say, uh, with the biggest one being just understanding, accepting, and and seeing responsible use, which you could never do when it's a black market. It has to be legal before people can observe responsible use, other than incidentally, like finding out, oh, on the down low, my neighbor, the banker, uh, who's a great guy and has wonderful kids, uh, actually has been token up all these years. And I found out about, you know, it's illegal and, you know, not not something he trumpets, but I found out, you know, uh, that goes on anyway. But making it, you know, publicly acceptable because it's legal will will really advance that. Well, thank you, Adrian. And as we come into a close, um, before I mention the future guest, do you have any? How how can folks reach you and maybe sign up for your your newsletter on drug policy? Yeah, um, if you go to reason.org, um, uh, that's our main policy website. You, most of you probably are more familiar with reason.com, which is where all of our journalism is. And you can see on the screen there, you can click on drug policy right there and see all of our work in this area. And you can click on newsletters there and sign up for newsletters by topics. So you don't have to uh, get the download. You know, if you're not into transportation, you don't have to get that stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, I would have loved to have had time to ask you about that because you, you have a deep background in that field, transportation. But um, Bob Poole did talk a lot about that a, a few weeks ago. So uh, thank you, Adrian. And coming up over the next month, next week, we do have the immigration debate with a well known attorney in the area, Charles Cook. And from Cato, Alex Norriste. Then we have the controversial informed consent presentation from Drs. Meehan and Hooker, who works with the uh, CDC whistleblower. Then we'll have the ever controversial Professor Walter Block, Mr. Libertarian himself, 
discuss Trumponomics and his classic work, Defending the Undefendable. And finally, in a month, we'll return to the welfare debate with Mike Tanner from Cato on whether we should replace welfare with a basic income, which I think one of the Democrat uh, candidates is really pushing hard, uh, Mr. Yang. But uh, we'll continue to push the envelope on controversy to make this weekly webinar event worth coming back to. So, Adrian, thanks very much.